Hi everyone, I'm Sasha and uh, Hi, I'm Yair. Uh, and today we're going to just talk about Mamba and try to give you a sense of how it works and how you can use it for your problems. So uh, let's get started. Okay, so this is a tutorial on the Mamba model. We're going to focus particularly on the problem of large language modeling with long context. This will be both a long input context that consists of a complex task description and also a long form generation as part of the answer. Um, if you're interested in language modeling, you've probably seen enough of this problem and understand why it's important. The dominant model in this space is obviously a transformer language model. Transformers are arguably one of the most important inventions of the last decade. They represent all interactions between all tokens in the sequence. Uh, and to do this, they require highly optimized training. Of course, we now have really great packages to run transformers at large scale. However, even though we are able to run large transformers, they do have some inherent challenges. Transformer inference scales poorly, and in particular, it scales poorly in memory. The particular problem is that the KV cache, which is the values that the transformer needs to store, scales linearly with the number of tokens you've generated. Specifically in this diagram, when processing a sequence X, we have to store vector values K and V for every previous position. The second challenge is that training scales poorly. In particular, it requires compute O of L squared in the sequence length. As sequences get extremely long, this requires computing a large attention matrix in order to compute our output Y. Now again, there are very optimized ways to get around some of the challenges of this large attention matrix, but we still really inherently need to compute it. These two challenges are the central motivation for some of the recent work in new architectures for language modeling. In this talk, we're primarily going to focus on Mamba, but there have been a series of papers that have proposed relatively similar ideas for modeling large sequences with more efficient models. The central theme behind all these works is to combine algorithmic design with hardware-aware implementations that can take advantage of the fact that modern machine learning models need to run efficiently on GPU in order to be competitive at language modeling. There are two properties that all of these models share. The first is that they have a fixed sized memory. This memory will remain constant during inference and will not change in size as the sequence gets longer. Now I do want to note that just because this is constant size doesn't mean that it's small. Many of these models have very large but constant sized memories. The second key property is the use of linear compute. Again, this doesn't mean that the compute is small. We're going to be using a lot of compute it's just that it's not going to scale quadratically with the length of the sequence during training. But of course, none of this would matter if there weren't results that showed that this style of model could be competitive with transformers. The Mamba paper showed that as the model scaled in amount of compute, Mamba models kept pace with even the best transformers on pretty large language modeling tasks. These results outdid many of the previous attempts to build these linear scaling models and showed that it might really be possible to build a very effective language modeling with this style of model. So with that brief intro, let's talk about the plan for the tutorial today. Rather than go through all the details of the Mamba model, we're gonna break it down into four different parts. We'll first talk about understanding the structure of the model itself, then talk about the algorithms used to compute it in practice. We'll then talk about designing an effective version of the model and finally talk about scaling the model to its maximum possible state. The tutorial is technical, but doesn't assume any background in either continuous math, complex algorithms, or the underlying hardware. We'll try to do everything from first principles. So let's begin by talking about understanding the model. Whenever I read a deep learning paper, the first thing I do is try to understand the shapes of all the objects involved. To do this, we're going to use a schematic diagram that tries to explain the shapes of a general fixed state sequence model. Our input will be x. x is a matrix that represents the length of our sequence by the neural network dimension. We'll sometimes refer to this neural network dimension as the number of channels. We're going to process each element of x by combining it with the previous hidden state to produce a new hidden state. Our hidden state is of length 1, but it contains all of the original neural network channels, as well as an expanded DIM, which we draw as the depth. To produce the output Y, we simply process each one of our hidden states in sequence. As a warm-up, 
let's consider a specific instantiation of this formalism. Here we're showing the math for a vanilla recurrent neural network. The network processes each xk one at a time by first multiplying them by a matrix B bar. This value is then added to the previous hidden state hk minus 1, which is multiplied by a matrix A bar. A nonlinearity sigma is then applied to produce the next hidden state hk. Finally, yk is produced by multiplying hk by c. We're assuming here that the hidden state h might be slightly bigger than the original channels of the neural network x, but otherwise this is just a standard vanilla RNN. You might remember that people stopped using these models at NLP because they were thought to be both challenging to learn well and also inefficient to train historically. With the advent of transformers, people mostly moved away from this class of model. Our second warm-up is a model known as a linear time invariant model, which we'll refer to as an LTI model. This model is basically exactly the same as the previous vanilla recurrent neural network, except we've removed the nonlinearity sigma. This model is just computed in exactly the same way, except to compute the next hidden state h, we don't need to apply uh, nonlinearity. This model was historically thought to be much harder to learn than a recurrent neural network, and in fact, when applied to random problems, often performed quite poorly off the bat. The story changed based on a series of papers leading up to the paper S4 published in 2021. These papers showed that LTI models could be really fast to use and actually really effective. The key insight was a mathematical transformation that made it possible to run realistically sized LTI models using a convolutional implementation. We'll talk about this a bit later in the tutorial, but for now, I just want to note that these results showed that you could effectively apply an LTI model to perform very well on long-range sequence modeling in fact, significantly better than RNN models. The results on the right show that these models even outperform transformers on a relatively simple long-range benchmark. These results got a lot of researchers, including myself, very excited about the possibility of applying LTI models to language modeling. However, this by itself doesn't seem to work. In a set of careful experimentation, researchers have shown that on moderately sized language models, these LTI implementations seem to really underperform attention-based transformer models in terms of overall perplexity. There are a lot of subtleties here about the difference in different models, but in general, none of them show really promising results when applied at even moderate scales. In the MAMA paper, they discuss two relatively simple reasons why these models seem to fail on language modeling. The first is that LTI models lack the ability to do filtering. By filtering here, I mean simply the ability to ignore incoming tokens. Think about the following application. You're doing language modeling on a website, and most of the text is text for an article. But every paragraph or so, there are just some words that are from an ad, or from a cartoon, or from just some irrelevant text. The underlying model can't ignore these words. It's not that it learns not to, it's just that it mathematically can't. The B bar matrix has to be the same for every word, which means that if there's some XK you want to drop, you basically just have to add it to your hidden state uh, no matter what. There's a similar problem with the A matrix. Imagine we're processing a web page that has many different articles. When we get to the title of the next article, we'd like to forget basically everything we've seen before. This article is just a different piece of text to model. It's irrelevant what the first article said. But unfortunately, we have no way of resetting H. We have to basically update H every time by using the same A bar that we had before. We have no way basically to reset our history and start again. We have to basically remember everything with the same rate that we had for just standard language modeling. There's a well-known historical parallel to this conundrum. It was seen that RNNs had this similar sort of behavior. And because of these issues, people switched to other more complex models like LSTMs and GRUs. These models build in explicit gating to allow the models to ignore certain inputs or to throw away their hidden states. Now, it's not exactly the same because these models are nonlinear, but there are similar issues in both cases. The solution proposed to this problem is going to look pretty trivial. 
uh, but we'll see why it's a little bit more complex in the next section. We're basically going to switch from linear time invariant models to a model we'll call linear time varying. And the only difference is that we're going to allow a bar, b bar, and c to change depending on the position in the sequence. So instead of having a single matrix a bar, we'll now have a bar sub k for each position. This small change fixes all of our problems. If we want to reset our hidden state, we simply set a bar sub k to zero. That matrix multiplies by our previous hidden state, removing it entirely. If we want to ignore an input word, we simply set b bar sub k to zero, and it just ignores that word. LTV models allow us to have selectivity over our input. But where do these position-specific A, B, and C come from? Well, we're going to construct them, just like you would with the Q, K, and V matrices for attention. We're basically just going to take our current position X and use it as a way to produce the A sub K, B sub K, and C sub K value that we need for that position. We'll discuss this in more detail in section 3, but for now you can think about it as basically analogous to attention. Okay, so to summarize, these LTV systems are going to be a really promising approach for language modeling. At this point, I've explained basically the entire system that's used for Mamba. The key innovation is that we're fixing a central issue that we saw with LTI models, and this will allow us to maintain a fixed size state, but still get the selectivity we need for things like filtering and resetting. But that alone isn't that interesting. Uh, many of the key innovations are how we actually get this kind of model to work and to work effectively at a large scale. So next up, Yair is going to talk a bit about the algorithms that underlie Mamba. We now turn our attention to how we actually compute these linear time varying models. For that, we're going to leverage the literature on parallel algorithms, specifically the reference shown here on the slide by Blaylock. Let's begin with what we can potentially call the hello world of parallel scans, or the cumulative sum. This is perhaps too small of a term because as we'll see, the algorithm mechanics that we developed for the cumulative sum will translate directly to the linear recurrence that we're gonna to try to calculate for our linear time varying models. In the cumulative sum, we have an associative operator, namely addition, and we have an input vector x and we wanna have a running sum on the output vector y. At the top, we have our input vector x, accumulate a running sum, record it on the output vector y that's at the bottom. Let's change notation to this slightly more suggestive one we have the linear recurrence defined as a hidden vector h, which we'll initialize to zero, that will update as we see new inputs from our vector x, and finally, we'll read it out with the identity function to our output vector y. The parallel of associative scan algorithm runs in two steps. First is the upsweep and then the downsweep, where the elements of the input vector are at the leaves. As we go up the tree, we'll aggregate the associative sum higher levels of the tree. We continue up this tree, the root of the tree which holds the entire sum of the vector. And as you can see, we're starting to accumulate some of the running sum elements that we'll need on the subsweep. The next part of the algorithm is the downsweep. Mechanics are listed at the bottom of the slide, but essentially what we'll do is we'll use the elements that we've calculated at the upsweep, start to have to aggregate them as we down down this tree, and eventually we'll have the cumulative sum at the leaves of the downsweep tree. Now, as I mentioned, this is working for a cumulative sum where the associative operator is the well-known addition operator, but if we want to apply this to the linear occurrence that we defined earlier for linear time varying systems, it's not obvious at first blush how to make that happen. And indeed, to define this as an associative scan, we'll need some new primitives. Namely, rather than taking the input x as is, we'll package it as this tuple, where in the first entry, we have our time varying a parameter, which updates our hidden state. In the second entry, we have the matrix vector multiplication between the time varying b parameter and the new input x. We'll also define this new associative addition where over this tuple a1, b1, and a2, b2, we have addition defined as the first entry being the matrix matrix multiplication of a2, a1, and the second entry being the matrix vector multiplication of a2, b1, and the vector addition of b2. And we'll proceed exactly as we did with the cumulative sum with the elements of this new primitive tuple on the leaves. And as we go up, we'll apply the associative operation, eventually having the full sum at the root of this tree for the upsweep. Let's show this more explicitly with our example. We take our elements that we've packaged at this tuple at the leaves, and as we can see all the way at the left, the first element has our first hidden state already. We go up the tree, 
applying the new associative operation that we'd previously defined. And eventually at the end of the upsweep, we'll have some of the elements of the cumulative sum along the nodes of this tree. And what we're not going to show here, but we'll have the downsweep as well, which will aggregate all of this cumulative sum for this new associative operator, a new primitive. Now using this, we've shown how one could computation that's linear in length and compute it in a logarithmic factor in length using parallel hardware. But we also want to touch on some other algorithms you'll see for computing these linear occurrences. The first is that of the convolution perspective, and this is applicable only to linear time invariant systems, not the varying ones that we've just described. For the linear time invariant systems, what we'll now show is that we can equivalently have a recurrent or a convolutional view. At the top of the slide, we're showing an unrolled recurrence for the linear time invariant system. And because the parameters A and B are no longer time dependent, we just simply get this powered up versions of A as we unroll in time. And when we take this convolutional perspective, at train time, we can now efficiently compute this in parallel as a convolution between some k bar vector, which we show here, and the input x. Alternatively, there are recent works that throw out this entire notion of the parallel scan and compute things just as a linear scan, as they find it is more effective on certain hardware, such as TPUs. So we've discussed some fast algorithms for LTV and others, but now our question is, how do we in practice compute those A bar and B bar and C matrices that are used in the linear occurrence? In this section, we'll discuss more about designing an effective LTV model. Recall from the first section that we defined a linear time varying model as basically a linear recurrent neural network where the matrices A bar, B bar, and C vary with the position in time. These matrices are created based on the current input X, and they determine how we update our hidden state and how we utilize that hidden state to produce the next output Y. In this section, we're going to look at several different ways for defining these matrices. The goal here is not to tell you which I think is correct, but to give you a sense of the different ways you might utilize architectural choices, but end up with a similar LTV form. The first option is perhaps the most straightforward. We're going to define a functional form that allows us to directly predict A bar, B bar, and C, just as if they were other components in a neural network. In this representation, which is used in the model known as Griffin, we're going to produce a recurrent and input gate by running a standard neural network over XT. We'll then produce A and B as functions of these intermediate values. This gives us some representation for A bar sub K, B bar sub K, that we can just plug in to our LTV algorithm. A second option is an approach known as linear attention. This approach is used in many different papers, but here I'll use an example from RetNet to explain how it works. To make this trick more clear, we're going to rename B bar as K and rename C as Q. We'll also rename our input X as V. This paper notes that when you do this and then expand out the equation for our final output O n, we see that we get a sum over all previous positions m. The inner part of the sum consists of multiplying Q n by K m V m. Summing up over all previous positions, we get our output. The connection to attention is that the inner part of this sum looks a lot like the QK transpose V calculation that we do in standard attention. In this particular paper, the A is used to represent a relative positional encoding. Now, the only difference here from standard attention is that we've removed the softmax. The usefulness of this connection is that we can initialize or directly connect these parameters to the attention parameters of a standard transformer. I do want to note, though, that practically this really is just an LTV model. So while the connection to attention is nice, we can still think about this as having a fixed sized hidden state and compare it to any other LTV form. Finally, let's dive deeper into the parameterization used in Mamba. This one is a little trickier and often is scary for people on first read. The main difference is that instead of directly predicting the parameters A bar and B bar, we're instead going to think about a continuous time representation of our data. In particular, this form is known as a continuous time state space model. Now, when you look at the equation, it should look very similar to what we've seen before. We're still going to have an A, B, and a C. 
The main difference is that instead of thinking about it in discrete steps k, we're going to instead think of these as continuous functions with input argument t. Also, instead of thinking of each h as happening in sequence, we're going to think of it as a differential equation where we have a formula that tells us the rate of change of h, and that's the formula that utilizes a, b, and our input x. It's a little bit weird to think about language as being a continuous time signal. So let's look first at a kind of standard 1D continuous time signal and try to develop some intuition for language. In this example, the true history is going to be a continuous line represented by the black curve. We're going to be producing a hidden state of four dimensions that's going to be represented by the four blue lines at the top of the graph. These four lines are going to try to summarize the history of this continuous time signal. They're going to do this by approximating a polynomial that will be represented by the red lines in this graph. Because we only have four values, we cannot remember everything that we've seen about the history of this signal, but we can try to compress it and try to get as close as possible. As we move further in time, our hidden state will be less and less able to capture all the details of the black line, but we will be able to remember a lot of the near-term details and capture the rough pattern of the further history. At the end, we've gotten all the nearby values, but really just have a sketch of some of the earlier structure of this signal. Now, of course, in this example, the signal was quite complex and we were given a very limited hidden state. But if we have more hidden state values, we can capture more of the previous information. While the analogy to language is not perfect, you can imagine how having many hidden states, we could capture a very long-term range of language by modeling how it changes over time and all the key curvatures of the previous document. For Mamba, we are going to build a model that acts in continuous time. However, because we are dealing with words, we are only going to receive values in discrete time. In linear time invariant models, we can assume that these values come at a constant fixed rate. For linear time varying models, we are going to assume that these values may come at very different times. And to represent this, we're going to have values delta 1 through delta L that represent the distance in time between our incoming word tokens. Of course, we don't actually know the distance between words in continuous space, so we're going to predict these values delta from the input x. Once we have these delta values, we'll be able to convert from our continuous time representation into a discrete time LTV representation that we are used to. So let's put this all together. The first thing we're going to do is to predict continuous time values A and B. We'll also predict the values delta that tell us how far apart our input steps x1 through xl are. Once we have this conversion, we'll map A and B into A bar and B bar which are their discrete time counterparts. We can then run our parallel associative scan in discrete time to get our output values. These output values represent what we would have gotten if we had run the continuous time state space model, but only gotten out each of the samples corresponding to the points of x. So why do this conversion? The continuous time machinery really gives us an intuitive notion of time that's hard to get in the attention representation. To see this, let's look at the discretization formulas. These are the formulas that tell us how to approximate the continuous time formula with an LTV model. These basically need to be run at every forward pass of the model to take into account the predicted delta values. Roughly, they tell us how to treat distances in continuous time between tokens. These values relate to the two failure cases that we saw earlier in the talk. Recall that the first failure case was that we didn't have a nice way to turn off B bar such that we could ignore an incoming word. The second failure case was we didn't have a way to reset our hidden state by setting it to zero. We had to basically keep around whatever our hidden state was and hope that incoming words reset its value. 
Intuitively, we want to think about filtering as compressing an incoming word to the smallest possible value in time. Specifically, we're going to have delta basically go to zero for words that we would like to ignore entirely. If we look at the discretization formula, we can see that as delta goes to zero, a bar goes to one, and b bar goes to zero. This tells the model that these words are extremely not important and can basically be ignored when updating the hidden state. This is a nice intuitive way to think about words that are not important. If there is some filler that we want to ignore, we basically compress it to zero. We can think about resetting in the same way. If we get to the title of a new chapter and we would like to reset our hidden state, we can simply set that word to have basically infinite length. This makes the model basically forget its hidden state. Here we are assuming a is a negative value, and therefore this goes to an exponentiated negative infinity. This sets a to basically zero, which resets our hidden state. Again, this is a pretty intuitive way of thinking about memory. If enough time has passed, our hidden state basically goes to zero. So to summarize, in this section, we saw several different ways of producing the LTV parameters. We can directly produce them with the neural network. We can interpret them as some form of linear attention. Or we can use a continuous time parameterization. Mamba uses this continuous time representation and argues for interpreting words as living in a continuous time space. This allows us to interpret things like filtering and resetting as simply corresponding to distances in a timeline. All three of these approaches basically dynamically construct the parameters for every input x, and then utilize those parameters to compute the output y. One main challenge, though, is that all of these approaches seem significantly slower than using a linear time invariant model. We basically construct these for every input on every layer. So we're going to have to be extremely careful with how we actually build them and how we store them all in memory. So in the next section, Yair is going to talk a bit more about how you do this in a hardware-aware manner and make it possible to scale very large LTV models for modern problems. We've previously discussed the importance of the hidden vector h and how its capacity can determine how expressive an overall network will be. We now turn to the careful design decisions that will allow us to make this h as big as possible. First, let's recall some of the notation and dimensionality. Our input and output x and y have dimensionality length by channels d, and our hidden state will expand that through this additional expanded dim end. The players in the linear time varying system, and specifically within the Mamba implementation, are as follows. First, we have the input and output vectors x and y, which have dimensionality length by intrinsic dimension or channels d. We also have the parameters of the system, a, b, and c, and the time discretization parameter delta. Crucially, all of these are missing one of the key dimensions, either length, d, or n. We have our a parameter, which is d by n, because our hidden state is applied to every input channel. And we have our parameters b and c, which are carefully chosen so that they are time-varying, but don't exceed a certain size. Finally, our discretization parameter is applied at every single time step and will be time-selected, and therefore it is length l by d channels. The objects that we need to be most careful of are tensors that contain all three of these dimensions, length, expanded to factor n, and intrinsic dimension d. These are going to be our discretized parameters a bar, b bar, and the hidden tensor h, which contains the run running hidden state as we progress in the sequence. The mental image that we need to have in mind when applying hardware-aware algorithms to this linear time recurrence is this slow memory transfer between the global memory of a graphical processing unit GPU and the fast memory SRAM where this computation will happen. Keeping this high-level schematic in mind will help us understand the design decisions in the hardware-aware implementation of Mamba. Let's first look at what the quote-unquote naive computation would look like for this associative scan. One would first take the parameters A, delta, and B, send them to SRAM where the computation would happen, and we would get our discretized parameters A bar and B bar. We would then retrieve those from SRAM back to the high bandwidth memory and then go back to compute the hidden tensor H. This hidden tensor would once again be passed between this barrier of SRAM to high bandwidth memory. And then finally, we would compute the output or the readout 
which is the matrix multiplication between C and H. The solution, which avoids these high memory transfers of these large tensors A bar, B bar, and H, is to fuse this computation. If we recall in the linear time invariant system, we completely obfuscated materializing this H. Here, although we need to materialize it, the hardware aware implementation only does so in SRAM. In the fused computation, we're very careful about what passes between this barrier between SRAM and HPM. And although H is materialized in SRAM, we reduce its dimensionality to Y before coming back to high bandwidth memory. This fast implementation does carry with it some additional considerations that one needs to be careful about. Specifically, because we fuse the operations, we can no longer use auto differentiation. And therefore, during the backwards pass, we need to recompute the Hipton representations that are no longer stored by the auto differentiation engine. This one tail having both an left to right scan for recomputation and an R to L scan in order to get the gradients. This R to L scan can similarly be computed with the same parallel associative scan that we covered earlier. We just saw some hardware aware implementation details that allow us to expand the hidden dimension as big as possible. In the MAPA paper, there are additional design decisions that further expand this hidden dimensionality. First is that the dimensionality D is expanded to a factor of two before going to the sequence mixing operation. And the other is that for every similar layer former, we apply two Mamba blocks. Okay, let's conclude by talking a little bit about where we are in the current state of Mamba. We begin the talk by talking about some of the perplexity scaling results of running Mamba in practice. With all the tricks we've seen today in the talk, these results show that the model was scaling similarly to transformers on serious language modeling tasks. In particular, on long context language modeling, the perplexity was keeping pace with the amount of compute that these models utilized. Mamba is quite effective out of the box. Some of my students were able to immediately take the Mamba code and apply it to some tasks that were hard for transformers to do well on. For instance, we were able to take Mamba and run it on a byte level language modeling problem and show that with significantly less compute, our models were able to achieve better performance than raw transformers and even some of the best transformer byte modeling that was existing in the literature. There have been many such results even in the last couple of months. Very recently, AI21, a language modeling company, was able to produce a model they called Jamba. This is a model with basically seven Mamba layers for every one transformer layer. They found that this combination was basically able to achieve the same performance as a transformer only model. The benefit of it was that it was able to do much longer and much less expensive inference by using a fixed state size. They did find that only using a Mamba model underperformed that of a transformer, but it's actually surprisingly close. It seems possible with some more extensions, it might be plausible to get a Mamba model that performs as well. These questions are being explored very intensely. People are looking into whether these models can do long-term retrieval, whether these models can perform well on zero-shot tasks, and people are looking into really, really pushing the limit into how fast these models can run at inference. I'm really excited to see what results will come out in the next couple months. Beyond that, though, there is extreme interest in just applying these models to all sorts of different applications. Beyond what I talked about today, there are applications in image processing, image generation, video generation, and all sorts of interpretability. Having another model class that's competitive with transformers opens up all sorts of interesting areas for research. And without making any predictions, it'll be really interesting to see where this all goes. Um, thanks so much, and uh, thanks to Yair for helping out with this talk. Um, hopefully we'll put up some more videos on this in the coming months.